make the screen big. And uh, over to you, Jess. Hi, yeah, so I'm Jazz again. Um, and I'll just do a bit of an overview of the hazel dormouse. Um, they're a species of mouse that we live that lives in our ancient woodlands, uh, typically, but they are found elsewhere as well. They are true hibernators. So they they enter hibernation in sort of late September, October, and then they come out of hibernation um, like May. June sort of time. Just sometimes waking up earlier. now. This yeah, year. just waking up. Sometimes a bit earlier, but I mean, with climate change, it's getting earlier and earlier. So um, we've got data looking at um, temperature differences between in the ground, above the ground, and within nest boxes, um, and PTES, People's Trust for Endangered Species. They run a monitoring program where they put nest boxes in woodlands across the country. And um, they, yeah, they monitor them every year to to get an idea of the population. So we're using that data with the temperature data um, and other temperature data that we have from the Met Office as well to see if there's any trends between dormouse absence um, or absence presence of a nest. Um, Are you I should add as well, actually, about the dormice. They they usually over winter go down into torpor hibernation in the leaf litter. So they build a nest in the leaf litter. That's where it's nice and stable temperature. Um, That's in the natural habitat with no yeah. humans here. Yeah, but even in captivity as well. I mean, we uh, I worked at Wildwood Trust where we bred them for release and they would still go down into the leaf litter during, during winter. Um, we would provide them the space to do that. So, yeah. Why um, should I care about dormice? Well, they're they're an indicator species. So they if there's dormouse in a woodland, it means it's pretty good, um, pretty good habitat for lots of species, really, because it, it have high species abundance. Um, yes, they they eat lots of different foods and yeah, they need quite a specific because they're arboreal. Um, they need a lot of understory within a woodland so they can move around. They don't like coming down onto the ground. Um, so yeah, yeah, they're a great indicator species and shows that we have a healthy woodland. Okay, good. Then we had something else. Oh, and we then there was this thing, the National oh, yeah. Dormouse Monitoring Project. Yeah, so the monitoring project from PTES, and they also run release programs. So the dormouse, I, dormice I worked with last year, breeding. That's an they, actual picture from the site. <laughs> yeah, that was from the release day. That was the like press dormouse. Yeah. Um, he was one of the ones that that we raised and then got released this year. So, mm -hmm. so it's really exciting. And and the data that we're looking at is sort of we want to know what happens in the summer when it's too hot because the the recent heat waves have led the question of are they using short bouts of hibernation to survive those periods as well? And if so, what are the likelihood of them doing that in the leaf litter um, rather than up in the canopy or in the nest box because it could have quite quite a lot of implications for management wise I mean they're a protected species if we find out that they're going into the leaf litter in the summer then we need to to think about how we're managing woodlands in the summer as well as the winter yeah making sure we're not disturbing them so yeah I think a thing the only thing I would add about the national dormouse monitoring part I should disclose I know you know this but I have done some work with the People's Trust for Endangered Species in the past, and uh, they write an annual statistical report of, about all their data. And I, I wrote that report one year for them and supported it a few years. This was some years ago. But this has been going on yeah, really for a long, long time, time, over 25 years. Yeah. And a lot of sites in the UK are monitoring sites, usually in nice woodland areas like Jazz explained. Mm -hmm. They're in any one year, there are around, do you know how many sites in a given year are monitored? I don't know. Lots. I might be able the, to about think. 400 when I did really? the, it was yeah. around 400 when I did the my analysis, maybe more now. And uh, at each one of the sites, and Jazz's data are at two different sites, 
um, the minimum spec to be included in the analysis is that um, there should be 50 nest boxes. And when humans um, provide nest boxes, they often are occupied and used mm -hmm. by dormice. And, and it's convenient because they're very cryptic. They're hard to find. They sleep mm -hmm. for you know half the year. They live up in trees. They're real small. Yeah. So it's convenient to have these nest boxes that you can monitor for presence and absence. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're used. So the two sites that we'll be talking about in this data each have exactly 50 nest boxes. Yeah. To be part of the monitoring project, um, each one of the nest boxes must be checked on uh, at least two occasions in a year, but yeah. but often they're they're checked more than that. Yeah, I think. Four or five, six, even more times than that per year. And volunteers do this. This is purely volunteer mm -hmm. led, and it's funded a little bit by the charity PTS yeah. and the local wildlife ch ch trusts. It's all under license and uh, as well there because they're protected you have to have a license to to do all this and a lot of professional yeah. ecologists have those dormice licenses because yeah. it's one of the protected species i was going to copy this link i don't have the slides up on the website but if you're interested in reading about this what the story is about is um that one of the one of the efforts to to protect the dormouse, they've been declining. There's evidence, pretty good monitoring evidence that they've been declining for about a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're doing reintroductions to reverse that and doing woodland uh, restoration. And they're called the hazel dormouse because they like to eat hazelnuts and hazel coppicing formerly was yeah. a big thing. And the, they like to get in the, um, the dense growth and then there's the food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing hazel coppicing and other things like that. Shall we go to the data? Yeah. All right, let's go to the data. Now, one of the things that I've already mentioned to Jazz that I wanted to, to say right away is uh, we've mentioned here in the in the um, our boot camp about tidy data. And if we start with tidy data, it's the thing you have to learn. You know, you have to learn how valuable it is. And so if you look in the data folder, there's uh, the untidy version and the tidy version. So if I just look at the, there are three different data files. Uh, one of them says nest box data. One of them says Met Office averages. And one of them says I buttons. Well, with the Met Office data are minimum, maximum temperatures and rainfall for an overlapping time period for the study where we have data for the monitoring. The nest box data are records of, uh, there are two different kinds of uh, records in that file. I'll show you a peek in a second, but just verbally, one kind of record is a record of the visit. So on an occasion when a site was visited and they have things like um, how many of the nest boxes um, had dormice in them, and how many of the nest boxes had nests present in them, and some other things. And another tab on that sheet shows um, individual individual lines for individual dormice, one line per dormouse. And that one has records like the um, sex of the dormouse, the weight, and uh, what other dormice were in the same nest box if there was more than one and a few other characteristics, their body condition, a few other things that can be measured quickly. The eye buttons we haven't um, talked about yet, but maybe I'll draw a picture of, of this one. The eye buttons are um, a device that is a sensor. And the sensor, if you're out in a woodland and uh, there is a dormouse nest box that might look like this, and a little hole that the dormouse can go into. Um, the eye buttons are sensors that, if this is the ground, um, maybe one sensor would be here and it would log. It's just basically a, a uh, environmental logger for temperature. And is it just temperature that they log? Yeah, just temperature of these ones. And how often do they take the temperature? Every hour. Every hour. And so then they, they have one, I think, inside the nest boxes. Mm -hmm. And then one somewhere out outside the yeah. nest boxes. 
And the idea for these, I think, in my own words, mm -hmm. we would treat this kind of like as a statistical consulting <laughs> thing, is that um, we want to know the differential of temperature from the outside and to the inside of the nest box. Of course, there's not much insulation in a nest box, so we might not expect very much unless there's metabolic body heat. Yeah. Um, and then the ground, we would expect to be more stable. And the idea here is that if the weather is going crazy and maybe even with consideration to climate change, can we can we quantify how much more stable the ground temperature would be, more predictable? A thing, I had a PhD student some years ago, I mentioned to you, who worked on dormice, and we did a project with the PTES. And one of the things that he found was that um, when the when the temperature in winter w was very variable, that uh, the dormice had lower reproductive success. And uh, the explanation that people seem to like and agree with, experts in dormouse physiology agreed with, was that uh, when it warms up in, temp in the winter, um, the metabolic services and homeostasis of um, dormice kicks in. They come out of torpor even just a little bit and they use up their energy stores. Yeah. Exactly. And so they don't have any left over, and sometimes they don't make it through the winter. Yeah, yeah, it's a massive thing, and that's been studied quite a lot. And um, it's really interesting because I read a study that that happened, and they just don't they just don't have the energy match that with food scarcity to go through the reproductive development. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it happens in many species. It's really interesting. So part of the data that we have are um, counts of dormice at each site, at each visit. And um, because many of the nest boxes have zero dormice, um, a lot of the data are zeros. And then, you know, we have like a couple of ones and then like a two and a three. And uh, the distribution of data like this is very much non-Gaussian, and and actually, I've, I, this isn't to scale. There, it's mostly zeros. But one of the things that that um, I like to do with data like this, it, it goes for if there are any entomology researchers in there. You probably even heard me say this to you or your supervisors before. Is that the the easiest way to change data like this is to convert all of these um, counts that are relatively low numbers to ones where there's a presence of dormouse or some other uh, thing that you're measuring and the absence. And if we have data like this, um, we can create a probability, and this is some kind of variable like temperature. And uh, you know, if this goes from you know 10, 11, 12, whatever the scale might be, then we can statistically model the probability relative to this variable down here for whether you predict presence or absence or a zero or one, a death or survival, any any variable that um, has has two states. And and actually, I can't remember whose it was uh, recently. I did an analysis with someone that um, had uh, a multi, multiple um, states, more more than two. And you can do an aversion of this kind of model called a multinomial regression, but this is called often a binomial regression. Now for Jazz's data, one of the things I'll show you that I did is that um, you have a lot of choices about how to create the data and arrange the data set to do this kind of analysis. Um, I should just write what it's called, uh, binomial regression. And it's it's also known as a um, binomial GLM or generalized linear model. And this is the kind of thing that you would see in, in the literature a lot. Now, one way to arrange your data like this would be um, for every nest box, you'd have a row in your data set, and you'd have a zero or a one. But remember, 
Jazz's um, data set, the one that we started with, is is not individual nest boxes, but it's it's visits to a site. And for each one of the visits to the site, it's the count of the number of nest boxes that had at least one dormouse in it. To do this kind of analysis on data that is aggregated, where the numbers might be zero, they might be six, they might be two, they might be one. To do this kind of analysis on that, what we do is we we treat each visit. Um, remember, there were 50 nest boxes that were checked on each visit. And we treat each visit to an individual nest box as an experiment. This is this is language. Just entertain the language for a second, and I'll explain it. But it's the kind of language that's associated with um, with binomial data. So where where you have an event that happens that results in a one or a zero, the the kind of accepted term that we refer to is that it's a little experiment. It's an experiment. It's like flipping a coin would be an experiment. You get either heads or tails. And let's say you do fifty experiments. So how many heads do you get? You might get 24 heads, 26 tails. So this variable in Jazz's data set is, is like the successes out of 50 experiments. And uh, to analyze the data with a binomial regression, one way to do it when it's arranged in this way uh, is, to, is to treat your dependent variable in terms of the numbers of successes and fails or for however many experiments. Every, every visit here had exactly 50 experiments. If it didn't, we would have to weight the regression by how many experiments were performed. But thankfully, this is simpler. We don't even have to worry about that because they're all equally weighted. So for each of these, we would have to create a column that had the number of fails out of 50. So this one would be 50, this one would be 44, this one will be 48, this will be 49, and so forth. <clears throat> so we have two kinds of questions that, that I, in my words, we were looking at. One kind of question was about the presence or absence of dormice, zero, one dormice. And one was about the presence or absence, zero, one of nests. And then there was a, a third question that was about the variance in temp for those I buttons. Okay, so that's what we're going to do one at a time. Now I mentioned that I've made tidy data. I'm just going to show you the tidy version of one of the data sets. This is a little bit like a bigger version of that um, ID data frame that I made. One of the things that I did is I have changed the um, the names to be very consistent and short and remove spaces and special characters like on this weight. So my version, um, this is the untidy version. This is the tidy version that I've I've changed most of those things for. I've also changed the names to be very consistent so that different um, data sets have exactly the same name for exactly the same data. And notice that the um, date is in that format that is the preferred international standard. It's even got a name, ISO 8601 or year-month-day, I just love it. <clears throat> um, now we have to, the reason I comment on that is we have to deal with dates in date format coming from Excel when we move to R, so I'll show you about that. Now for a real data analysis like this, my rule, my personal rule for working with data like this, there are three different data sets that are arranged differently. One has is organized by visit, one is organized by individual dormouse, and one is just the I button data. Um, 
if I have more than one source data file, instead of just writing an R script, I write an R project. That's easy to do. We've done it before in here, and I'm not going to do it again so that we can get through this. But if you try to run this yourself, you'll want to open the R project file um, dot R proj and uh, wait to open until you open the R project, wait to open the R file. I have the data in a data folder. Then I have another scripts folder. And for uh, for projects, if I'm going to load libraries, I usually make a separate script just to load the libraries and a separate script to do stuff with the data if I need to massage the data. So I have those two scripts in there. I'll show you how that works in a second. I'm just going to open the project. <clears throat> One of the nice things about creating an R project is that it automatically it automatically um, sets your working directory, and it, we can just look at that in the files section uh, over here. So it already assumes our working directory is um, exactly where I want it to be in this this lead folder, um, just like this. So if I open up the master analysis script, which is that R code, you notice I've put in a header, put in a clickable table of contents, and we've got our contents over here. And I'm going to go through the setup, which will read in the data and the libraries that we need. And then I'm going to address those three questions that uh, we did. And if we have any time at the end, we can work on maybe looking at some other questions. So there's something with the um, Dormouse presence and absence, something with Dormouse nest presence or absence, and something about the variance of uh, the ground and the box and, and outside the nest box. I have some miscellaneous code at the bottom. That's a little mysterious. I can't remember what I put in there, but I think it's just junk code while I was. I do that a lot. I always have a miss. And if I use sources, if I have to Google, I will always have a sources section and I'll put those links where I've Googled code. It's almost you always code. If I've Googled somebody else's code or a GitHub repo that I've used, I'll always put a link to it for my own future self later on. So before I run this, this uh, little script, I'll just show you what's in it. Um, we never have to open these scripts that I'm, I'm calling with the source function. Probably haven't shown you this source function before. What it does is it just runs the contents of another script. And here I'm telling it to run a script called libraries.r that's in my scripts folder. And uh, what it does then is it just loads the libraries. This one's fairly modest. There are only five libraries that need to be loaded. If you're going to load this yourself, you'll need to install these libraries first or you'll get an error. So if I just run this, we can look down in the console and see evidence that something is happening. Three, two, one. Some stuff has happened. It's giving me some warnings that um, I need to update my R version. I'm only I'm only a few months out of date, so I'm not going to rush to get the newest version. That's that's always bad to do that because stuff breaks if you get the newest version. Then the data um, script. Now, this is a little more involved. Here, what I've done is I've read in the three data files, visits, dormice, and iButton. And I've read them in from the Excel files with the read.xlsx file uh, function. Then I've fixed the dates for those dates because we might be interested in looking at some of them. In fact, one of my miscellaneous codes I just remembered was looking at the count of Dormouse by date for each of the sites. So we'll have a peek at that at the end. I wanted to have the dates in order. If if I just read in these three data sets, three, two, one, and I look in the Dormouse, um, let's look in the visits data object, and I look at the date, look at that. This It says this date is 42273. Now the reason for this is the it's a technical reason about the way that Excel stores dates or any kind of string, character string or numerical value that 
is recognized as a date in Excel, it actually stores it as an integer and it has a code to translate that back into a real date. And the secret to the code is this. I'm about to tell you the secret. The secret of the code is that this is the number of days that have elapsed since an arbitrary date. My birthday is December 30th. My birthday does not happen in 19, 1899, but Microsoft chose my birthday in 1899 as their origin date. So what we do is use the as.date function and set the origin to that, that date. If you get other systems, there are other systems with different origins. And I just can remember the one in Excel quite easily because it's my birthday in 1899. So keep your eye over here on this date uh, when I run the next couple of lines, three, two, one. So it's changed it now to a date format and we can see the first date that we have um, data for is 2015. September 26th. Um, while I was trying to figure out how to analyze this data, I made some proportions for the number of boxes with door mice. I ended up not using this in my analysis, as I'll show you, but um, I did the aggregate function on box number as a function of site plus date. So for each date and each site, I would uh, come up with the uh, the, this is the length of unique X's, the length of unique box numbers, and that is the number of box numbers that have door mice present. Um, if I just do that code real quick to see what it looks like down on the console, three, two, one. These are just the number of, of nests down here that have door mice in them. So I had to create this variable and it's the number of boxes with door mice. So I'll just run that, three, two, one. And that pops up in the visit data frame down at the bottom. And then I also made a few more. I didn't end up using these, but it's the proportion of um, of uh, number of boxes with dormice and number of boxes with nests divided by 50 because there are 50 dormice at each of these sites. I ended up not using this, but I'll just do it anyway. If I just if I just get rid of all of this with the broom go back to my main folder. I only went through that to show you and talk you through how to build this, but uh, you can load it quite easily. I'm just going to run line 315, uh, line 15, 321. And it just goes through all of that automatically. So that's the setup. The first thing I wanted to do was to um, analyze dormouse presence or absence as a function of the the variables that we talked about that you measured. So <clears throat> this is a generalized linear model. We use the GLM function. There are other ways to do this. This is the way that I like to use it. Um, the arguments for this are the formula. This is the whole formula for it. <clears throat> I'll come back to this because there's this funny C bind thing here, and I'll explain that in a second. Then there's the family for binomial regression. Um, we specify the family as binomial with a logistic link. And the way that we specify that is set the link argument to L-O-G-I-T. And then the data are visits. Now, what is it about this, this uh, formula? The funny part about the formula is, is um, this part. If I just copy that part and make a new script real quick. <clears throat> What's happening here is um, I've got the visit with the number of boxes with door mice. I'm just going to print that out in the console, three, two, one. Remember, these are the number of successes for our 50 experiments. Each one of these numbers is the number of successes out of 50 checks of 50 dormouse nest boxes. 
So remember, I, I said we need those two columns of the number of successes and the number of fails. And so what I've done is I've column binded this number of successes and then I, I bound that to 50 minus the number of successes, 3, 2, 1, which is the number of fails. And if we submit this whole thing, 3, 2, 1, we get uh, one of the choices for doing binomial regression for this kind of data. So that's what's happening in this. And I'm just going to run it real quick. Three, two, one. And we get a summary. Three, two, one. We get a familiar looking ANOVA table. And what we see is that the met temperature minimum is not significant. The met temperature max is not significant. Remember what we're doing is predicting presence or absence of dormice. The met rain millimeters, not significant. And the site, there are two sites in the data set. The sites also do not differ in the proportion of successes or failures. Now, um, I should have shown the other one first because there are some significant ones in the other one. But, but um, just to evaluate this, what I would do first is make a series of graphs that show that binary relationship, the proportion relationship that is, against each one of those variables. So I'll show four graphs <clears throat> in order. So the first one is, um, is um, the temperature minimum, three, two, one. So this is the proportion of occupied nest boxes as a function of the minimum temperature that the site experiences. We've drawn the logistic regression line on there. Um, we do that, haven't done this uh, very much in here recently, not with the boot camp going on, but we do this in the ggplot world by um, specifying this um, geom smooth using method glm and uh, listing the family as binomial. And um, we could put the standard error in there in case you wanted to see an error bar around the bar. Now, because this isn't significant, we know the error bar will be huge. We'll just, we can just kind of look at what that looks like. Set that to true, three, two, one. Yeah, so the we don't know whether the regression coefficient is different to zero. This looks a bit different than the other one because the uh, scale has been reset so that it can contain this huge standard error around the prediction. Because of that, I didn't draw it on there. It's just a little bit of vanity, three, two, one. It looks a lot nicer there and it doesn't really matter because it's not significant. So let's look at it for the temperature max, three, two, one. Let's look at it for the rainfall, three, two, one. And let's look at it for the site, the difference between the sites. We don't have as many observations for the second site, but we can just see the variation is pretty large for the presence of dormice. So the second analysis is um, perfectly analogous to this one. It's the same exact predictor variables. The only thing that's different here is here we're predicting the presence of nests. And there were more nests than dormice most times. And this might be because um, people would, the people coming and sampling the nest boxes do this a lot only in the nice part of the year because that's the same time of year that the dormice are out and about. And if it's real nice out, I have always wondered this. I debated it loads with a lot of people is uh, if it's really nice weather out moderate weather and there's food around the dormice seem like they would be likely to be in the trees and where there's food or in the ground or wherever so uh, we might expect some different results here okay so we do the same analysis three two one and here we see a few moderately significant things. Here we see for the presence of nest boxes that the minimum temperature 
Um, and now let's uh, let's evaluate what this estimate means. The estimate means that um, as as the minimum temperature increases, you're less likely to see nests. It's a negative estimate. Does that make biological sense? I don't know. Let's we can untangle that, but there there is there is a relationship there. It's not very big the relationship, um, but it is significant. It's marginally significant, p less than 0.05. The other one that's significant, um, which is also um, a very small effect size, is that um, is the rainfall. And that's a positive relationship that is different to zero, but it's very small. And again, the sites are not different. So again, let's just look at those graphs. Um, the relationships. So the first one is uh, the temperature minimum that is significant, three, two, one. It's a pretty good graph. It it shows. Um, it looks like a very strong signal, and it is a pretty good fit for the one. I'd be pretty happy for ecology to see a result like that. So I think it's important. But the uh, notice that the scale over here is rather small because that's the observed scale it goes from around zero up to 0.3 only up to 0.3 if we look at the now our, the next one is not significant the temperature max if we look at the next one three two one this is not significant but something funny is going on here why does it look exactly like the previous graph, but it's not significant and the other one was significant? So one of the things I haven't yet done, this is just the first blast analysis, is that um, when you are creating linear models like this and you have, you're not in an experimental setup where you've controlled everything. Instead here, we're just kind of thinking about what might influence these observations in this study. And uh, we, we're kind of plugging them in and seeing if anything sticks. There's a danger here for this kind of modeling. The danger is like this, that um, I have already discussed this with Jazz. Um, but uh, if you have two variables like uh, the T min and the T max, and they're they're highly correlated to one another. And uh, then you do a, a model. Let's just call this one A and this one B. And you have some Y variable as a function of A plus B. And maybe you have another model that's Y as a function of B plus A. You have this weird phenomenon that comes out is that uh, in, in this one, you'll get A as highly significant and B as NS. Down here, you'll get A as NS and B as highly significant. The reason for that is the order in linear models. And so this is a, this is sort of a, um, a downfall of, plugging lots of variables into a thing and probably what we should do probably what jazz will do is uh, think about um think about where the information is in this one, one way to do it a really statsy way to do it would be to do a principal component analysis punch all of the weather data down to one variable and use that one variable in the model another easier much easier way to explain to normal people is to say that the minimum temperature is highly correlated to the maximum temperature and we're more interested in the minimum temperature because cold weather would have a direct effect on a small mammal and so we're excluding temperature max it's probably far easier to do that okay so that's why we it looks like there's a big effect but it's not significant let's look at rainfall three two one this is very, very um, big scatter, 
but it uh, it is significant, um, but not a very big effect size. And then difference between the sites. I, I got a million of them, George. I, I can just keep going every data set. I can go. I can go deeper. Oh, please do. <laughs> please do. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so um, that's basically the story for the first two questions. And then the last story was um, about this I button data. This had a lot of observations, uh, but you know they're not they're not all that interesting because it's it's collecting a lot of data, different intervals. And uh, really, the question here is about variation within and between the different variables. I've done some data wrangling, which I'm not going to really talk about very much. Three, two, one. It's turning the I button data into long format from wide format. We talked about that in the in the um, boot camp, and I've just plotted it as a box plot. Remember, these are all they're actually paired observations because they'll all be taken on the same day. I haven't graphed them exactly like a paired one, but here's the box plot: three, two, one. You orient your eyes to this. Um, we can see that uh, this is just the temperature in Celsius on the on the uh, y-axis, and down here we've got external. So this is the external data. This is the ground data. And this is the internal data. Um, the data are probably Gaussian, and you can see a very small little effect of difference, where the the mean temperature, the dark line, of course, on a box plot, is the median. But we know that the median should equal the mean if the data are symmetrically distributed. And it, and it looks like they approximately are. So it looks like the uh, mean for the ground data is approximately um, a little bit smaller. I've calculated, just so we can see the descriptives, the mean and the standard deviation for the temperature data using the aggregate function, which we've talked about before, three, two, one. So it uh, looks like we're getting about a um, little more than a, a half a degree, about a half a degree C lower temperature on average in the ground. But uh, the, the kind of big story, the one that I know Jazz was interested in, is is the, the ground temperature more stable? And it's one whole um, degree Celsius of standard deviation less variable. So it's kind of kind of a big difference. I just asked the mundane question with a Kruskal Wallace. We probably could use analysis of variance here, but I use Kruskal Wallace, a non-parametric version of the the test. Um, whether um, there is a difference between the means three, two, one. It's just on the cusp. If we if we used analysis of variance, which probably would be appropriate. Instead of deleting that, um, the reason I use Kruskal Wallace is I, I feared the data would be skewed, but it turns out they they really weren't skewed. Uh, the thing about these non-parametric tests, this is a non-parametric test of ANOVA, of course. The thing about them is they have lower statistical power. And so for the same amount of data, they would be less likely to detect an effect, even if it's real. So if we try out the ANOVA version, well, look at that. The ANOVA is um, is also not significant. So it's a bit of a surprise. But uh, anyway, there's not much in it on the, on the temperatures, just right on the cusp of an actual difference in the mean temperature. But the thing that... Um, that uh, Jazz was interested in is whether the variance was smaller. It certainly looks like it is. So uh, the way to do this kind of test where you're testing overall, is there a difference between all of the variances, is the Levine test, three, two, one. And there, there is an overall difference. That's not surprising because it's a 20%, 25% difference in the standard deviations. And I've gone ahead and done the the pairwise tests as well, to ask 
is external different to ground? Is ground different to internal? And is internal different to external? If I just do the ground versus the internal. <laughs> um, you know, it's highly significantly different. And ground to external, highly significantly different. And then just external to internal, not different. There was a little, this is one I did earlier. That's what they say. That's what the chefs say. So it, yeah, it took me a little more time to do this, but. Um, and then in the MIS code, okay. So I've got a little script that just makes the actual count of dormice by time. Uh, this isn't the prettiest graph, but uh, what it shows is um, the number of dormice as a function of the date. It's just abbreviated the individual days. There is a thing I mentioned to Jazz about this kind of data that um, I ignored for this analysis because the, the visits to the site were approximately monthly. Um, we assume with normal regular statistics like this that that uh, your observations are independent. We, we know that is not quite true with dormice. If you measure the same thing in the same place through time, there may or there may not be a time dependency. So if you think of like the stock market or an animal population, if uh, you start off in one place and you go up, um, there's a dependency on the value at the second time upon the first time. And the longer the time is between observations, the the weaker that dependency might become. So the, the actual periodicity of that time dependency is important. You can take a, account of that with um, with uh, regression methods. So uh, there, there are lots of ways to do it. Economists just love to do this kind of modeling because they model things like financial changes and value changes and uh, things that have explicit time dependence. Um, I didn't do that here. It's, it's easy to do, it's straightforward to do, but um, the, there's just not quite enough data here to do that. There's just not quite enough data here to do that. So uh, I'm not totally happy with that. We What we see in this is that the observations also don't ever overlap between the two sites for the whole time period. So we have a lot more data for the one site back here. If you squint hard, you might conclude that there's some kind of increase in numbers over time. Was Coleridge Woods an introduction site? No, I don't think so. No. It looks like these first few sightings, they only found like one dormouse. That must have been super disappointing when they started um, mm. <laughs> started started watching it. And then their their grand total was over 20, I think. Mm, yeah. The ones I was doing, they were quite good woods, the ones that I visited a few times, the ones that I was working on. One was um in North Wales near Chester Zoo. And we were getting like a hundred dormice off of 50 nest boxes. That's amazing. I mean, they were just packed. No, yeah. I take that back. There were there were more nest boxes than 50. I mm. think the, I think there were about a hundred. That's but we, amazing. But we were getting like a hundred dormice at the peak. Up oh, oh that's amazing up here as well. Because I mean, I was talking to someone from the Mammal Society and they haven't found dormice in the one of their Shropshire sites for like four years. So yeah. There's this, there's a fade as you go from south to north. The dormice do better in the south. Yeah, that's why they're focusing reintroductions up here. So, yeah, because the weather is also more extreme in the south at the minute. So the effects of that are more on them. I think this is the first time in weeks we've finished right on time. <laughs> um. What other kinds of questions are you interested in? We talked about some just before the meeting. Yeah, there was one um, so similar with the maximum minimum, um, how that affects the presence or absence, but I wanted to see how it affects the state, whether the dormouse is found active or in torpor. Um, 
So how yeah. the weather effect on the state of dormice? Let's mm -hmm. see here. So we've got <clears throat> that'll be in the dormice um, data. Now I haven't analyzed that yet. So we only talked about that. So this is the dormouse data. Give Excel a good long time to think. It's only a modern supercomputer almost. <laughs> so we have these ones that are breeding condition and torpid. And so which are you interested in all of these or just torpid? Tor torpidity. Yeah. So do you remember what the key is for two and one? I think one is active. Got it here. One is torpid. <laughs> one is torpid, two is active, and six, six is dead. dead. What is three? Unknown? Unknown, but that should never happen. Okay, so. Oops. Should, uh... Okay, so I think the way that I would do this is I'd probably code these so that <clears throat> they actually said active and torpid, so we didn't have to do that. Uh, translation in our mind. And uh, be, now because this is um, observations, like if I show these, these ones here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. We don't have time to do this right now, unfortunately, but um, these are all the same date, the same visit, and the weather will be exactly the same for these. And uh, so what we're what we're what we actually want to look at is maybe the mean condition. We'd have to say how like for each date, how many active, how many torpid. A way we could do that is um, to do a binomial regression model, but a mixed effects one, because we have multiple observations at each date. We could use the occasion of the visit as a random effect. And uh, we could do it that way. So that's what we would have to do. And are you also interested in the the three weathers and the two sites for that? What yes. Um, what do you mean, the metal fist weathers data? Or... Yeah. Yeah. So same how, explanatory yeah, yeah. variables. The yeah. same as same as the last two. Yeah. Okay. So this is exactly the same kind of model. Mm -hmm. with the exception that we would need to do it as a mixed effects model. And um, but we'll have to save that for another day because we're out of time. <laughs> so comments or questions, uh, just a few minutes. Any comments? Well, if not, thank you for, oh, George, do you have something? Yeah, just that it was really, really interesting. Um, and I actually learned so much. So yeah, <laughs> really enjoyed it. That's great. We should do. We, maybe we should do more generalized linear <laughs> and mixed effects models meetings. It's been a while since we've done that, as we've been doing the basics. All I right, think guys. it's also like the experimental design element of it as well, and picking the right test is really yeah, yeah in real life applications. So yeah, sorry, I'll shut up now. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, we'll do it. Let's do some more of it. If you have some ideas for this, those meetings in the future, let's, uh, you know, put them forth, George. Just let us know and we'll put them in there. And um, for everyone else, see you later. Thanks for coming. Let's stop the recording and say goodnight. Thank you.